more than a million Christians have been forced from their homes in Iraq. Scores of churches have been bombed, and priests and nuns have been brutally murdered. This is a group of Assyrian Christians whose families have spoken Aramaic for over 2,000 years, the same language spoken during the time of Christ. Many of them are being systematically kidnapped, tortured, raped, and murdered. For various reasons, the U.S. and Iraqi governments have been slow to act in providing these refugees with any protection. The same thing happened with Jesus. Now it, it, it will happen for us. Time is running out for them. Without prayer and swift action, their end is certain. In order to make this film, the crew traveled to many areas in Iraq where few, if any, journalists have gone. And where there is virtually no U.S. military presence, the stories you are about to hear may be disturbing, but they are real. At the end of this film, we'll tell you what you can do to stop this current day genocide. Between our people, our nationality, Assyria, in this region we are suffering before. And another, another reason is our religion, because we are Christian. People in Iraq are Muslim. If you ask me what is going on in Iraq and what the Christian community in Iraq has endured, there's a lot of gruesome stories needs to be told. One of them, for, for instance, is a widow that her husband was killed and here her son was kidnapped and she was asked for a ransom. They demanded the ransom, she couldn't come up with the ransom. It's a habit in Iraq. And when you uh, provide a meal, you put on, uh, you, you serve it in a, a big dish of rice, and on the top of the rice, the pieces of meat. What the what the uh, 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 the fanatics and the fundamentalists do is they took the child, they chopped his head, they put him on the top of the rice, and here here we go. They bring it to the to the mother, and this is here is here's your dish now. In 2003, when the government in Iraq, they move it. Yeah, my husband, he has a small store, very, very small. And like, you know, the Muslim people, they come into his store, they shoot him, like three shots, and they kill him right away. And be here, my daughter, she called me, like five o'clock in the morning. Just, I hear somebody crying. That somebody coming to my daughter's house, they put you know the mask in the face, and we have the um, shotgun. Yeah, they try the um, you know, ring the door, and then they tell her if you don't open the door, they want to shoot the under the door to open it. She's scared. She opened the door. You know the um, the reason they come in her house, they want to find um, her husband because her husband he have tattooed like the cross. My, with my daughter, they try to do sex with her, but she pregnant. But she don't tell me do or not. But I know they hit her, hit my daughter in the arm shotgun. They hit her in the head, in the stomach, in her back. And then that about maybe one hour, two hours, and she um, lost the baby, they take her to the hospital. Looked upon as infidels and collaborators with the West, Christians in Iraq have long been persecuted and treated with suspicion. The thing that is most unique about the current persecutions in Iraq is the individual level of violence. How can people take a six-month-old baby and roast him and serve him to his mother? It is barbaric. 
We were quite surprised uh, to see the very high percentage of those who have suffered direct violence. They don't flee because they, they heard a bullet or they heard a bomb. And about 16% had suffered torture. And 70 and 80% have seen uh, bombings. They've seen bits of bodies flying all around the place. They've seen killings. Um, about 50% have received uh, death threats uh, themselves. A very, very high percentage have been victims of, um, uh, or one of their uh, relatives have been victim of uh, abductions uh, for ransom. <laughs> My father was kidnapped in, uh, in April, uh, 8 in April. So it's one year. We don't know where he is or did he still alive? They released her husband to go to bring the money, and they left, left uh, with them the, her, her son. Yeah. Every day they speak with them and tell them to give us money. If you don't give us, we will kill you. Christian people here, they sacrifice everything but to keep the faith, as I mentioned. But here, in uh, generally speaking, in Iraq, they, the Christian people suffered the most. Since 2004, more than 40 churches have been bombed throughout Iraq, with scores injured. The church, a place of, of um, prayer for people, regardless what religion they are, is uh, a very holy place. If you touch that, you're touching them deep in their thoughts. And this will bring people to think twice. Should we stay or should we leave? Should we build back? Maybe it will be bombarded again. Do we leave the country? These are the questions that goes up on the heads of the people when they see the house of God are destroyed. Assyrian culture is unique in two respects. One is that it is an Aramaic-speaking community. It is the last living Aramaic-speaking community in the world. And also, all Assyrians are Christians. They're an Eastern form of Christianity, but there are many other phases as well. Aramaic people, the Chaldean Assyrian people, they accepted Christianity easily because the missionaries, they spoke the same language. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Our people spoke the Aramaic language. It was easy for them to uh, accept Christianity because of the language. First century, beginning of the second century to the third century, we had uh, a lot of churches in the Persian Empire, in Iraq, basically. And uh, Christianity became stronger until the seventh century when Islam came to the region. Jordan, Syria, and Turkey have become home for hundreds of thousands of Iraqi refugees. It is believed that at least half of Iraq's Christian community has fled their homeland because of persecution. It has been called the greatest refugee crisis in 60 years. It is a very sad uh, situation in which our Christians are now. Now, the churches in Iraq are very much evacuated, especially in Baghdad, the capital. The seminary, Chaldean seminary, is now moved to the north, the Kurdish side. Uh, lots of other churches are moving there, like the Syriacs, another uh, Christian group after the Chaldeans over there. They also moved their seminary to the north.
to the area called uh, Ankawa, Erbil, and so on. Uh, lots of these priests are leaving the country because, as you, you, you hear very much, they are also being killed. Churches have been bombed, as you hear in the news. And so you could say that there is a certain sort of conspiracy against the presence of the church, the Christian church in Iraq. When I first went to the Middle East in November 2006 to look at the situation of displaced Iraqis, I was overwhelmed by the extent of the crisis, the numbers, the scope, and the fact that it was now a regional crisis with refugees throughout the region, but also displaced Iraqis inside Iraq. Um, when I came back to the U.S. Uh, in December of 2006 and talked to the State Department about the growing humanitarian crisis, what I got in return was basically a denial over the existence of the crisis. There were no Iraqi refugees, they told me. These people were guests or tourists. This woman's brother was murdered by Al-Qaeda. Whether it meets the technical term for a genocide by international standards is one thing. What is certainly happening is ethnic cleansing. And uh, the ethnic cleansing began with the liberation of Iraq. Uh, it's a long-standing process that dates back well into the uh, 1800s and even before that. Uh, of course, in 1918, 750,000 uh, Syrian Christians were, were murdered uh, at the end of uh, the Ottoman Empire. Again in 1933, uh, uh, and uh, again in 1952, uh, large massacres of the Christian population in northern Iraq. So this is a process which has repeated itself in its past, but today it is ongoing and as part of the process of liberation, which makes it so um, ironic. This is a hidden urban refugee population. And most Christian Iraqis can wait years in these Muslim countries where they cannot work because they are Christians. They are often unwelcome. <laughs> And paid more than $250,000. After that, they kill him. It's very, it's very important. Uh, the problem which stems from the overly broad application of particular provisions in the 2001 USA Patriot Act. We have people who have provided support, so-called support, under duress. The best example of that would be um, you know, an Iraqi family who provided funds to um, a group of people who kidnapped a loved one and attempted to provide funds to that group in order to secure the release of their loved one. Under our U.S. law, such a person is inadmissible to the U.S. because such an act is considered support to a terrorist organization, 
even under duress, even at gunpoint, even if the support was as minimal as a dollar. And so in uh, community after community, home after home, business after business, there is a note left, uh, a telephone call made, uh, all threats. If you do not leave, if you, you are not gone by a week from today or by tomorrow morning, uh, your family or your children will be, uh, will be killed, your home will be burned down, et cetera, et cetera. And so what people have done is to try and bring some reason to this, to save their children's lives or to uh, stand up for the priest who is the pastor of their church by saying, look, um, uh, if we give you some money, just go away, please, because this is, this is our home, this is our community, uh, and not wanting to be uprooted. Now, you want to take that kind of a scenario and say, uh, well, then they're terrorists for doing this. That's a form of madness in and of itself. My husband, who was talking with him in the phone uh, about the ransom and uh, what they did from us, why, why you did this with us? It was a difficult time, very difficult time for us. Then uh, they take, they took from us, from my husband, two thousand, ten thousand dollars, to to just uh, take him alive. My brother was kidnapped too. Thank God, he came back. But there is uh, hundreds and thousands of people that were kidnapped. Their ransom was paid, and they never came back. The Christians of Iraq do have supporters in Washington, but without pressure from Americans, little can be accomplished. It, it adds insult to injury, to put it mildly, uh, to exclude people from consideration uh, for refugee status because there was a gun placed at their head by terrorists and they had to pay ransom to save the lives of their loved ones, then to say, oh, you gave money to terrorists. That is, I believe it's an insult to people's intelligence. It's offensive. We've done everything we can to turn this around. We've urged the State Department not to apply that uh, principle. We've gotten involved in loads of individual cases. When you look at the tens of millions of people that comprise the country of Iraq, uh, Christians are a very, very, very small percentage. And out of that small percentage, there are so many that have fled. That's A. B, I think that uh, given that, uh, that in our talks with the Iraqi government, we have to keep bringing up uh, the Iraqi Christians so that we place it on their radar screen. When I visited Iraq and raised this uh, with the leadership there, uh, they gave a very, very weak, weak response. We asked for an interview with a representative from the State Department or Homeland Security, but they refused to speak with us on camera. I would still consider that Jordan and Syria have been extremely welcoming towards these, uh, these refugees. The means that the refugees had to survive, which is very much uh, savings they had brought with them, or remittances they get back from Iraq. Uh, all these are drying up, and therefore uh, their living conditions are becoming more difficult. We are illegal here. We are illegal in Jordan. We want to build our future. We want to, to go to another country. People, they are very much in need. They are out of work. They cannot work. They have no residence, no official residence. Uh, they don't know when they can move. They are applied to the United Nations uh, for relief, and they, they are waiting. Troubles always, why, why not? We've also established with Anna Eshu a, a Christian, Iraqi Christian, but Christian minority caucus for the Middle East, Christian and Baha'i and other minorities because the Christians and other minorities in the Middle East have a very difficult time. Coptic Christians have a very difficult time in Egypt. Uh, the Baha'is having a very difficult time in Iran. Uh, the Assyrian Chaldeans having a very difficult time and other Christians in, in Iraq. And force the, our government, but also other Christians around the world. I mean, where has the church been on this issue? Where has the Where's the church been on the West?
another two and a half million Iraqis are considered internally displaced people. They fled their homes because of the war and religious persecution. A significant percentage of Christians have come to northern Iraq and to the Nineveh Plain, their ancestral homeland. Here, they hope to provide for their own security. Three in three different, four different displacement uh, happened to Christian uh, since uh, 61 in revolution, Kurdish revolution. We were the first victim because our villages in 61 were completely destroyed by rebellion by uh, Iraqi army, which were uh, founding uh, Kurdish rebellion. But Christian villages were burned, were were looted, were everything. We were always uh, attacked and bombed by uh, Iraqi army uh, in our villages. When you see the, the, the suffering is for both Kurdish and Assyrian and Kaldu Assyrian Syrian people who, who suffer in, in the same way. The main purpose for coming today is to uh, participate in the distribution of food parcels to displaced people. They are telling me that uh, most of them they come from Baghdad and they were displaced from their houses, from Dora, from Baghdad Jidida, and uh, because of the problems of uh, targeting them, so they left when they came here. For, for religious uh, he, he was very much in the, the church near, so he was driven. Those who threaten us, they took our house and they are in our house now. The Nineveh Plain is unprepared for such a large influx of internally displaced people. They face inadequate shelter, no schools, high unemployment, and a lack of food. Now, very little aid has been coming into the Nineveh Plain. There is some, but you know, very little. Most of it appears to be uh, some emergency humanitarian aid of the sort that we delivered, food parcels for displaced people. This kind of aid, as welcome as it is, is not enough to keep people on their own uh, land as they are facing pressures uh, to leave. كم لي نصراني well the number one priority has to be to deal with the people who have never left the christians who have never left some in, some in Baghdad now, some down in Basra, but a lot up in the Mosul area. How do, you, how do you help them to keep them from going through what they're going through? So American foreign policy is to help to democratize and advance freedom in the Middle East. 
In order to do that, you have to have forces of moderation. And the Christians and other the non-Muslim minorities are the force of moderation in the Middle East. Secondly, we have a moral obligation to sustain those who are most vulnerable at this time in, uh, in the history uh, and, and as well as in the past. The Christians and other non-Muslim minorities in Iraq are quite vulnerable. <laughs> فقيري يعني وانا ما احكي له. بالنسبه للمعمل خيالي صاروا في سنه 2004 الهويه دي 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 انا متلمذه من المشروبات ابدا. Or housing facilities have been provided. They are often poorly built with widespread unsanitary and unsafe conditions. One of the issues is that uh, the, so many have fled to the north. The good news is, is that um, they are welcome there. The downside is, is that the dollars previous to this have really flowed into the hands of the Kurds, who have had much sympathy from Americans and, and others. Minister Warda has had four assassination attempts on her life. You know, I was also already finished the, the, the time of my ministry. So normally I was not officially uh, in, in my post because they know I love Iraq. So they are not happy when they see subjects who are not corrupted. And they know I, I was representing Christian. This mother of 11 was made a widow by terrorists. Her daughter tells the story. community that is at real risk. We have been a contributor to that risk, and we have a responsibility to help protect that community, and the Christians in Iraq deserve that protection. It's really too early to say whether uh, the blood of the martyrs here is going to nourish the church and to make it uh, thrive and grow, grow stronger, or whether it's just on its way to uh, extinction. We simply don't know the outcome of uh, this drama, uh, but it is a drama and it is a, a bloody one. And I and many others here in the Congress uh, are determined that we are going to do everything we can uh, to give the kind of protection uh, which morality and justice and history requires for that ancient Christian community in Iraq. <laughs> That was a quote from Edmund Burke, but spoken in Aramaic, the language of the threatened Assyrians. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. If we had known now what we know about what was happening in Rwanda in the last decade, or in the Sudan still today, or in Nazi Germany, wouldn't you have wanted it stopped? Unless we take action to help these Christians, they are in danger of becoming extinct.